Good morning, everybody. Uh, for some of you who were with us last night, uh, you remember the greeting I taught you in Swahili, and we are going to try to do it again. Um, so the greeting in Swahili I'm going to do, I shall say Hamjambo, which is asking, any news with you, or how are you doing? And then he will greet me back, Hatu Jambo, which means we are cool, we don't have any news, we are fine. So I'm Jambo, then you tell me back, Hatu Jambo. You ready? I'm Jambo. <laughs> Asante. Uh, I shall begin by, um, Craig, are you? Okay. So I'll let you take a look at this and then we'll continue. Two brothers who began life facing overwhelming hardship, but they showed potential. The people of their small African village recognized that and launched the two on a journey to America that has come full circle. Remember where you're from, go to America, remember us and make sure that you come back and help our community. Milton and Fred's parents were school teachers in Luwala. Working extra jobs, they got their boys to a fine Kenyan prep school. Then, incredibly, Milton won a full scholarship to Dartmouth College in the U.S. But he couldn't afford $900 for a plane ticket to get here. The village sold their chickens, and cows, and goats, and they saw it as a way of investing in one of their own. Milton was followed to Dartmouth two years later by his brother Fred. They wanted to be doctors. At home in Lawala, their father was planning to build a health clinic, but AIDS took the lives of both their parents. I was hoping he would live to see me graduate through college. It was at the funeral that we told the um, village, just kind of everybody, about building the clinic. We wanted to do that uh, in honor of my dad. They found people wanted to help. 78,000 pennies were donated by children. Brothers went on to medical school at Vanderbilt, and a local reporter heard their story. I just found myself. That reporter quit his job, went to Kenya, made a documentary that raised thousands of dollars more, and the new clinic broke ground. Don't forget us, you know, whatever. Those pennies paid for bricks and mortar, new shelves and medicines, and hundreds of the needy lined up the day it opened. Milton and Fred's clinic has already treated 30,000 people. That debt to the village for the original plane ticket, repaid every day. In all of this, I feel what ties it back is just, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so we choose Milton and Fred Ochen. Fulfilling their father's dream of building a clinic in their remote home village to fight AIDS. This vision will save thousands and thousands of lives. In the village, people were dying. If these kids really have faith that we are going to build this clinic, I don't think anything is going to stop us from building the clinic. Today, what you're doing is making a huge difference. There's a lot of suffering in Africa, but ours is a story of hope because this clinic, born from death, is bringing life and a future for our children. In five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. Dr. Milton. Ochiang grew up in the small rural village of Lawala in western Kenya. Milton is the second born, while Fred is the third born in a family of four boys. It's been three years since the clinic opened. We've got our own nonprofit now called the Lawala Community Alliance. And we've been sharing our story with audiences all over America. 
Their talk this morning is entitled Honoring a Father's Dream, the Story of the Sons of Lawala. Please join me in welcoming Milton and Fred Ochiang. It's been incredible to see how many people have come to the support of our home and our people. I'm always amazed at the way people respond. I guess some stories are just universal. They touch you no matter where you're from and no matter who you are. After sharing with you that video, um, please, for this, if you have your Bible around, uh, but if not, just we'll be reading from the book of Isaiah. And I shall be reading chapter 61 from verse 1 through 4. And it, it reads, uh, The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair the ruined cities and the desolations of many generations. Praise be to God. So, Luala, Kenya, Western Kenya, we are a, a rural village in the middle of nowhere, really. So, until about three years ago, we did not have any electricity, we did not have any running water. Uh, so, Luala village, uh, about 1,500 people. Uh, nearby community has about anywhere from 16 to 20,000 people. And about 13 primary schools. Primary schools are from uh, the first grade all the way through eighth grade. And secondary schools, we have only two of them in that um, immediate area. So growing up in Luala village, um, this was really kind of what we grew up with. Um, and basically, the work that we are doing uh, with the Luala Community Alliance and what we are doing, basically what we are aiming at is to build the capacity of the people of Luala and basically improve the well-being of the people there. The lady that's smiling, that's my aunt in that picture. And I'll just share with you some two brief stories, uh, basically regarding kind of our beginnings and how we got to where we are right now. So at the top right, you see me and my brother, Milton. <clears throat> and at the bottom, you see my mother and my father. Mom passed away in January of 2004, while dad passed away in May of 2005. And this was just a few weeks before I would be graduating from Dartmouth College. And you know, you may be wondering why it is that we do what we do and, uh, you know, Craig, flip to the next slide. So this is me at Dartmouth College. I think Craig has a little circle over my head. <laughs> so this is Dartmouth College. Uh, I was involved with the Navigators Campus Ministry. Um, and Craig Parker, he's sitting here, at, he's waving at us. He used to be our campus minister, and 
the reason why I'm bringing the story of Craig and kind of tying it to the bigger picture of what we are doing. Having grown up in our rural village in Kenya and seeing how the lack of healthcare facilities, uh, because to move from the village to get the nearest healthcare facility, you would have to go about six miles down an unpaved road, get public transportation, then travel another 30 kilometers or so to get to the main hospital. So growing up, I remember as a young teenager, you know, when one of our, one of our neighbors, the mother was in labor, developed complications. We borrowed the wheelbarrow from the local primary school head teacher. The young man in the village tried to wheel him down the unpaved road. Unfortunately, she bled and died before they could get to the main road to take her to the hospital to get some help. And so this is, you know, this is what you grow up with. So as young, as young people growing up in Loala, we became interested in medicine, trying to figure out ways in which we could help our people down the road. And you know, fast forward when late teenage, and that's really when HIV AIDS was claiming the lives of lots and lots of people back at home. And you saw the picture of my mother and father. And when we were at Dartmouth College, uh, you know, when my mother died, I was a junior in college at that time. So one winter morning, uh, 2005, this is about a year after my mother had died, we were getting ready to, you know, there was a Northeast conference that was coming together. Uh, different groups uh, were bringing different, you know, students from their navigators groups to fellowship together. So then Craig sent me, he had shared with him about our hope to build a healthcare facility in our village. So Craig emailed me one day saying, you know, it would be great to have a live Kenyan be at this meeting so you can share your vision of having a healthcare facility in your village. And this is winter, you know, I'm busy with all that I'm trying to do, playing soccer, pre-med major, all these things going on. And then I get this email from Craig. And you know, it's at that point whereby you know, you're faced with a decision. I knew that you know, we had to take a leap of faith and it really wasn't going to wait uh, knowing that mom had just passed from HIV and seeing so many other people who were in need of healthcare facilities at home. So I took that call to action, showed up at the Northeast Navigators Conference as a live Kenyan to talk to them about our vision. And really, up to that point, it was a dream. We had no money. And it's on that day that after my talk, you know, they raised over $9,000 to go towards the building of this healthcare facility. And really, from that moment on, with all the momentum that we gathered, God has been faithful, and we've seen many great things happen. So I just wanted to share that with you and a call to action. So what we are doing in, with our Loala Community Alliance, knowing that the well-being and the welfare of the people back at home, it's not just about delivering health care, because how did we get to where we are right now? You know, mom and dad sacrificed a lot. Uh, you know, to go to high school back in Kenya, you have to pay, you know, anywhere from 300 for the smaller high schools to five up to $600 if you're going to the bigger high schools. And, you know, they sacrificed a lot, took loans to be able to keep us in school. And really, it's through education that we were able to, you know, get trained really well, go to great colleges, great medical school, and here we stand, uh, thanks to the sacrifices of those who are ahead of us. So what we are doing is trying to look at the different ways in which the well-being of the people could be improved. So through education, through income generating activities, uh, through public health and income generating activities, so our economic component. 
<clears throat> so as I shared with you, after we began fundraising, you know, when, um, when we began, so Milton uh, was in med school, first year medical school at Vanderbilt. I was a senior in college. And so Milton made me the man in charge of fundraising. And I told Milton, Milton, you know, I'm really shy. This is not a really good idea to ask me to ask people for money. Unless I'm dying, I'm not really going to be doing this. But like we said, a time comes when you take that leap of faith, a call to action. So initially, we had a goal of raising $25,000 which looked like so much money to us back then. So, but after one weekend in January, after raising 9,000 in one weekend, then we said, well, you know, God is going to open doors. And, you know, by June of 2006, I mean, June of 2005, when began construction, we'd raised over 25,000 US dollars. So we were excited. We were going to make this happen. So... Fast forward April of 2007, after all construction was done, we were ready for the opening, and that was me dancing and celebrating with the young people in the village. Um, so this was the initial outpatient department, just 10, built, uh, 10 rooms in this initial building. And then April of, uh, basically 2011, uh, you know, we kept fundraising. We realized that, you know, like the story I shared with you of the mother who died in a wheelbarrow, the need for maternal child health was clear to us. So we wished we would have a place where, you know, women would be able to deliver their babies. And if there were complications, we could rush them to the bigger hospitals. So we opened this new wing, which tripled our size in 2011 about four years after we'd began operating. So since then, um, you know, we see, they say when you open the building, they will come. And indeed, they came. So we see up to, you know, 1,700 patients a month. Uh, you know, our number of deliveries have gone up from just about five a month before we had our small maternity wing to anywhere from 40 to 50 babies being born in this facility every month. So how does it work? Uh, so we have our local village leadership. Um, we have the village uh, development committee, and so they do advise our clinical staff and our clinical leadership. So they work hand in hand. While here in the US we have our board of directors. So these are, uh, the lady to the left is in charge of um, basically the clinicians, and Robert Kasambala, the gentleman to your right, he is our Kenya program director, so he is in charge of everything that we are doing back in Kenya. And then uh, US leadership, uh, top left, uh, James Nadella, who is our executive director, um, Kelly Baird is a brilliant young lady. Uh, she did her education, uh, got her education degree at the Peabody School, Vanderbilt, and she's been just excellent in working together with the folks at home, developing our education programs. Um, and then Catherine was down at the bottom. Um, you know, the work that we do... I think what's exciting about what we're doing is to see how God has used the story of this little village that, you know, if you show up to Kenya and you ask about Lawala, um, I think there are going to be several Lawalas to begin with, and there are these tiny little villages. So it's not like you show up and you ask about Boston in the U.S., um, but I think it's special that God is using this story from this little village out in the middle of nowhere to reach to people not just within Kenya, uh, but across the world, and to inspire hope. And I think the spirit of giving back to the community. So this has been an ongoing theme, and it's just exciting to see what God is doing. So 
looking at when we began, you know, April of 2007 when we opened, we had just about 10 employees. Fast forward to right now, you know, we have over 120 employees given that, you know, we've got so many different things going on and we have uh, folks who are involved, you know, community health workers, we have people who are involved in public health, so we have over 120 people in our staff right now. And these are some of the faces. Um, over 1,200 patients on HIV care, and you can imagine how special it is to know that people can now get care in the, in the facility, while when my parents were sick, they had to travel you know, more than half a day and be hospitalized 50 kilometers away just to be able to receive care. Um, so aside from our HIV work, um, clean water for our students. Um, so this is partnership between the Luala Community Alliance and our public health efforts, Jazz of Clay, and some of the other folks that we are involved with. If there's no clean running water in the village, so we are using clean uh, catchment, uh, catchment system, and so there's partnership. The community brings some materials and the Luala Community Alliance partners with them. Uh, so quality education, you know, we are passionate about education and kind of the power of education. You know, our parents were teachers. We know uh, what education can do in changing and transforming our society. So Kelly is working with the folks in the community, the teachers, uh, improving the curriculum, figuring out how we can improve the infrastructure in the schools, basically to have a better system. Um, our girls' education program, you know, simple things like just providing uniform uh, menstrual pads for the girl child. Uh, you won't, it's, it's hard to imagine that little things like that can impact, you know, a girl's ability to be able to go to school and stay in school. Uh, the lady in the middle, Leah, you know, she's, she's one of those remarkable stories in the village. And I think one of the neat things you hear when you go to Luala is uh, people who've been transformed. You know, Leah, uh, when she came into the clinic, she was HIV positive. She was so sick, uh, she had to be carried to the hospital. And after receiving TB treatment, HIV tre treatment, now she is back to her health, and she's able to give back to the community. So she is one of our community health workers. She partners with uh, the HIV patients, and they are a, light, a shining light. So she's, benef she's benefited from the facility, and she's also actively giving back to the community. Uh, we have our sewing co-op. You know, many of these women are HIV positive. This is one of our small income generating activities that we are doing. And just to highlight some of our challenges, uh, you know, look at that road heading to the hospital. You can imagine in our rainy seasons around April and May just how tough it is to get there. Uh, this is a bridge. You can imagine when folks from one side of the river are trying to come get care at the hospital, how challenging it is. Uh, HIV continues to be a challenge. Uh, and this is... This is the daughter of, you know, that head school, um, the head of the primary school I was telling you about whose car we borrowed. He's also a member of the village committee. The daughter was only 26 years old when she died from HIV, uh, and we grew up together. So these are still some of the challenges that we are facing. School attrition. So this is an eighth grade class. You know, when they began at first grade, there were over 70 students. By the time they got to eighth grade, only about 22 of them. Um, and nine of the 22 uh, students have one or both parents deceased. And then with regards to poverty and economy, so this is why we want to get more income generating activities going on to improve the well-being of our people. Education resources, you know, these are some of the books that we do have in school. You know, one book for every two to three children. And so improving the infrastructure that the students have uh, is one of the things we are trying to do. Uh, water sanitation. Um, and basically childhood diseases that we have to deal with. 
Um, just in finishing up, um, you know, these are the words from the book of Matthew 25. Um, and, you know, one of the exciting things about what we are doing is, you know, we figure out to improve the health and the welfare of the people, you know, you meet them where they are, when they are hungry, when they do not have a way to get education, uh, they do not have income generating activities. So this is what we are trying to do. You know, when they are sick, we are trying to be there as hands of God. So just in finishing up, um, you know, if you want to find out ways to be involved, uh, our website, uh, the Loala Community Alliance. If you Google the word Loala, I think the first Google search will take you to our website, Loala Community Alliance. Out at the back, we are going to have uh, a desk. Um, we have some DVDs. We have some information. So you can just pick up and figure out how to be involved. And, you know, my challenge to you is really let God move, uh, be moved by the Spirit, and do not be afraid to take that leap of faith. You know, for me, it was being assigned this role as a fundraiser, yet knowing how reserved I am, but knowing that it's not really about me, but God is trying to work through us. So I'm excited to see what God is going to do with all of you in different ways that you'll be involved. Thank you for having me here, and God bless you.